Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Eva Hermanovic from the European Forest Institute, more specifically New Forgen program where I lead the communication activities. And also I'm responsible for communications in other projects related to genetic resources. So thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you in person and engage with you uh, in a conversation after this presentation and also hear directly your questions. Uh, however, this is the circumstances that we are living right now, so we are making the best of, what, of the technology that we have at hand. Um, so thank you very much again for, uh, for inviting me here and today I would like to talk to you about storytelling for science communication and media engagement. And um, I will uh, give you a couple of examples of how we effectively use this approach in communication plans of the Euphorgen program. And I will also talk to you a little bit about breaking down the concept of storytelling. So just to start, um, everyone knows what a story is and everyone has listened to many stories in their lives. And we all know that storytelling has the power to engage, influence, teach and inspire listeners. That's why organizations should build a storytelling culture. There is an art to telling a good story and we all know a good story when we hear one. But there is also a science behind the art of storytelling. And I would like to start here with some science. Um, these are formulas and I wonder, this is a little quiz here for you. What could these be? We are, I can give you a hint, we are in the field of neurochemistry and this is somehow related to storytelling. So I cannot hear your responses. However, here I will reveal what this actually is. So the first one is cortisol, the second oxytocin and dopamine. These are three hormones that scientists are discovering that are released in the brain when we are told a story. And why does this matter? If we are trying to make a point stick cortisol assists with formulating our memories. We very often don't remember series of facts, but we remember stories. And this is how we remember the facts that were told in the stories. When it comes to creating deeper connections with others, oxytocin is associated with empathy, an important element in building and deepening or maintaining good relationships. This is what is created when we actually empathize with the protagonist in a story. We relate to them and the oxytocin is released. Uh, dopamine helps us regulate our emotional responses and keeps us engaged. So this is why, for example, when we watch a good Netflix series, we want to watch the next episode. This is dopamine steering our, mm, our emotions. Um, so staying a little bit again in the field of psychology uh, to understand how our brain works, uh, there is this nice uh, metaphor by Jonathan Hyde from the New York University and it's uh, the metaphor of an elephant and the rider where the elephant is our emotional brain and the rider is our rational brain. So very often we think that we take our decisions completely rationally but we have to remember that the big steering beast that is driving us on our path is this elephant so we do have some control and the, the secret here is to find a balance between the rider and the elephant uh, but we always have to remember that the emotional part of us is very strong and very, very big. So it's, there, is a, there is also very often a situation where it's our emotions that are taking us uh, wherever 
uh, wherever they decide. So what is actually a story? In a nutshell, it could be uh, summarized that it's uh, something like that has a be beginning, a middle and the end. It can be illustrated through this uh, narrative arc uh, where the chronology of facts takes us from the exposition through some kind of climax towards the or or um, where, where things get sorted out and resolved at the end. Um, it can be also shown differently as a story structure. So in the beginning, we have the protagonist with whom we empathize. Then in the middle, the protagonist is encountering some kind of challenge and a struggle. Uh, they might be living through a, uh, some kind of personal crisis as well. And in the end of the story, there is some kind of climax, a revelation and a resolution. Um, <clears throat> the, the narrative arc and the, the series of facts, the protagonists are not everything in a good story. There are also some building blocks uh, which uh, appear very often in a good story. They don't have to be there all at the same time. However, a good mix of some of them makes the story much stronger and much more powerful. So there is drama, there is suspense, surprise. There are some universal values that people can relate to. Uh, high stakes, so the, the, the story and the challenge actually matters. Uh, the character has the, some needs and some flaws. Uh, there is action because we don't like boring stories. There is some detail and there is also authenticity, which is very important in our science organizations so that we make sure we don't uh, mm, tell stories that don't sound, sound authentic, that sound like scripted, uh, but rather there is, a, there is an authentic element to them. And what does the audience get out of that? The feeling of catharsis, which is basically a release of the emotions and the tensions that are created from the beginning of the story where we see the challenges rising and then uh, the, the, the struggle somehow coming to an end the, in a bad or a good way. So, um, a few years ago, we produced a short film uh, for the Euphrogen program. And this is the first example that I would like to uh, give you for uh, uh, telling how we can actually use storytelling approaches in our, uh, in our everyday communication, uh, science communication work. And uh, this film was picked up by the National Geographic and um this has actually uh led to the fire to the film uh going uh, viral on the website um here are uh, a few statistics um, just to to show you the uh the reach of um of uh, what it brought so there were over three and a half million views a lot of comments which were actually proving the fact that the story was a very important element as to why the audience engaged with it so much. So this is one of the comments of the over 4,000 comments uh, that I picked is saying, this is so touching for the first time I've been touched by a tree story. Um, so people really do see the value of of the story and even those who are not specifically so interested in forest genetics could somehow relate to it and see the elements um, of, uh, that were uh, relevant for them. Um, the, um, the publication led to a lot of uh, press coverage that got interested and covered the story in their various media and articles. I just selected a few press 
other things here for you to see, but there was a lot more than that. And um, there was a, an, an article that went uh, together with the short film that was published, and it was reused very often in the various coverages by different media. Um, in terms of impact, there is also uh, a few highlights here that I wanted to share with you. There was a certainly increased funding from the government. Uh, foreign funders also got interested in afforestation and just citizens around the world who uh, were reaching out and wanted really to, to get involved in some action. It was really leading them to want to engage with the afforestation. And the main character also appeared in a 10 part series uh, on TV, uh, on global warming and had another uh, proposal to be part of a BBC Nature series uh, on plants. So himself also was, was a very successful uh, character and could then go on and engage with other media and talk about his topic. Um, so the second uh, example that I wanted to share with you uh, is another film that we produced uh, and published uh, earlier this year. Um, I will just uh, share, uh, show it here with you. We haven't really had uh, occasions due to the given circumstances to screen the film at various events. Uh, so it's too premature to, uh, to share with you any statistics and the impact that, uh, that it might have had because we are still uh, in the phase of uh, releasing it and showing it around. And um, the audience here today is one of the first ones to see it in public, even though you were watching it uh, from your own computers. Um, so, um, as we watch it, I would also like you to think about uh, the elements that I mentioned before on how the story is built and the different building blocks that make for a good story. And of course, I invite you to just enjoy it for yourself, but also in the back of your mind, think about how the different building blocks were applied in the production so that um, you can see how this is all working in practice. So I will now share, I will now play the film. It's just Three minutes. 20 million years ago, there was a huge volcanic eruption in the part that today is the Lesbos Island. And lots of lava started to flow, ash that covered the subtropical forest that existed at the time, started the fossilization process. And by that we know that we have an ancestor of today's black pine that was living here at the time Pinoxylum paradoxum. I was born in Lesbos. I was raised on this island. When I first went up in the mountains, there were two big black pine populations. One of these populations is almost gone. We may lose them. The second population, which is still in very, very good condition, has to be preserved. It's the speed of environmental change that scares me. With the climate change, you have fires occurring in the mountains, where black pine forests grow. And a very hard time for this species to adapt against its competitor, another pine species that grows in lower elevation and is coming up. Black pine doesn't have enough time to adapt in this kind of situation. And losing them is not only losing a few trees, it's losing all this genetic heritage going on for all these millions of years, not only on Lesbos or in Greece, but all over Europe and the greater Mediterranean area. 
The local forest service, they're engaged in, in forest protection activities, fire prevention activities, removal of ground vegetation. Under very, very limited means, they do whatever they can to facilitate the survival of black pine forest on this island. The broader the genetic base, the larger the chances of a species being adapted to some sort of steady state. It's important to remember that this is the birthplace of Theophrastus, the birthplace of botany. Aristotle came here as well, and together they studied the fauna and the flora of this island. So it's very important that we continue this legacy and we try to study in depth these species and maintain their populations for future generations. So that was the short film that we produced uh, to show the importance of uh, genetic heritage and the forest management to maintain the genetic diversity. Um, um, I would like to also take this opportunity to thank uh, Phil Aravopoulos for his participation and active um, engagement in the production. Um, the, the, both uh, films are available on the Euphrogen website and the Euphrogen channel, so you can easily go back to them and uh, analyze them for yourself with the elements of the storytelling. I will be very happy to hear any comments and respond to any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, related both to my presentation, but also in general to storytelling and how to uh, apply it for in the communication strategies of your organizations, especially related to science communication. So thank you very much and I would like to welcome any questions that you might have, both here uh, via email, via Twitter and in the Q&A session after this presentation. Thank you very much.